I was woefully underprepared and that was the truth of it. But then I realized, maybe I wasn't smart enough for this challenge. But there is an alternative to giving up when you can play smart, and that alternative is to Sometime in August, I've seen a tweet on Twitter, half showcasing, half making fun of the fact that ESPN was showing two people locked in a battle of wits in nothing other than Microsoft Excel. Unaware of the fact that Excel was an eSport back then, I closed the webpage paying it no mind, but a couple of weeks later, due to some twist of fate or perhaps a well-targeted remarketing campaign, I found the webpage for the Financial Modeling World Cup again, uh, this time at work. I half-jokingly suggested to my manager that perhaps the company I work at would be interested in essentially sponsoring a ticket for the qualifying round for me, as it was $50 and money's a bit tight right now. To my surprise, the company was both willing and able to bankroll a spot for me, essentially, and I took part in the qualifying round for the Excel Esports World Cup. So before the day of the competition, I did the thing that you absolutely shouldn't do when trying a new thing. I told all my friends, hey guys and gals and NBs, I'm taking part in the Excel World Cup. I think I'm decent enough at Excel that I might have a shot at competing, uh, even though I have no idea whatsoever how Excel as an esports works. And yeah, I will be performing. I might live stream it. This is a promise that I actually went back on a bit later. And well, I wouldn't be able either way, as when the day of the competition came, it was Saturday, and from the very morning I was mortified. I did virtually no prep, very little prep whatsoever, but I paid that no heed and I did a couple of breathing exercises, I reminded myself that literally nothing was at stake, which was true, uh, like my friends know that I talk a big game before events like these, so after I regained my composure, the clock struck five. London time, 6 here in Poland actually, and I received a link to the webpage. And the rest was history. So I downloaded and opened the file and that's when I hit my first snag. Task 2 was there, but none of the other tasks and the description mentioned 5 were to be seen anywhere. I frantically being aware of the passing time switched between the web page, the file, I tried opening it again, to no avail. The tasks were still nowhere to be found, and the stress that this caused was present with me through the entirety of the competition. So not the greatest start, but after a bit of frantic clicking around, I was able to open the other four tasks somehow. To this day, it's a mystery to me why they didn't show up at first. I think they were grouped in hidden uh, columns A and B. But with that bit of a rocky start, I got to work. I realized that the tasks had various difficulty levels uh, ascribed to them. I decided that I wanted to start with a medium difficulty one. I didn't want to start with one of the hardest ones, as I thought I would run the risk of getting so engrossed in trying to find that last bit of the answer that I would spend as much as half an hour and then miss out on the easy points from the easier ones. With that in mind, I chose task 1, Biathlon, as my first one. Task 1, Biathlon. The dataset shows 25 players competing in the fictional sport of biathlon. The sport consists of a shooting section and a skiing section. In each of the two rounds, each of the competitors has to shoot 5 targets or ski a penalty lap of 150 meters for each target they miss. In each round, each of the players skis at a constant speed of x kilometers per hour and the end result that I should provide is the total amount of seconds that it takes them to both ski and shoot on the target. It is assumed that each shot takes a constant of 10 seconds.
the idea of what I needed to do here crystallized in my mind pretty quickly. First of all, I would need to devise a formula that would calculate the number of shots each of the players missed. After I did that, I would simply multiply that by 150, the length of each penalty lap that they would have to take as a result. That would give me the total distance that they would have to ski. Then I could trouble myself with figuring out how fast they would be able to ski that distance at the uh, amount of time that it would take for them to fire 10 shots, because they were 10 seconds each, uh, irrespectively of whether they hit or missed, and that would give me the total in seconds for each player. I hoped that I could implement this strategy in a reasonable amount of time. The plan was sound, but much to my chagrin, I first fumbled with the logic of the count if formula, as I mistook which dots meant that the shot was hit and which ones meant that it was missed, and after that I fumbled some more with unit conversion. I mean, there is a reason why I nearly failed physics in middle school. That reason is not that I failed unit conversion, but it would be very topical if I did, wouldn't it? I managed to iron out these kinks somehow, and I checked the list of answers presented on the website, as the first three were multiple choice. And to my great satisfaction and great optimism, the answers did appear on the answer list. So onwards I went to task number two, which was rock, paper, scissors. Two players, A and B, played 20 rounds of 25 games each of the popular real-life game rock, paper, scissors. I was provided with a table of gestures that both players showed in each round, uh, presented as, for other difficulty I assume, as these cute little ASCII symbols for rock, paper, and scissors, and based on that I had to calculate the answer. My task was to provide the number of games in each round that player A won. So the first thing I did was use search and replace to get rid of those cute ASCII symbols, because even though I theoretically know how to do logical operations on these, they do creep me out, like I don't feel sure of myself when doing something like this. Immediately after that display of common sense, I took one look at my wax wings and decided that it was time to fly close to the sun. I devised a pretty advanced formula, for me at least, with ifs and multiple and operators. It was going to be majestic, even if it required a bit of Google foo because it's not something I use every day. Uh, the only problem with that formula is the fact that it, it, it didn't work whatsoever, in the slightest. So I dug deep. I dug deep into that programming 101, baby's first logical operators, sort of thing, and I found the answer. And the answer was multiple nested if operations. So essentially, if A played rock and B played scissors, return one, else check if A played scissors, B played paper, return one, else... And I essentially nested three ifs inside to make sure that uh, one was returned for every winning operation uh, that involved one winning, and I think it worked. All that was left was copying the formula to the other rounds and summing up all the ones that were given when, whenever player A won. By then I was about 26 minutes into the hour that we were given to complete all five of the exercises, and I was feeling alright. I felt that I was uh, reasonably successful with the first two exercises, and I felt that the stress from not being able to find them in the first place was kind of dissipating. But little did I know that the upcoming ones would test me to my limit. Being happily unaware of that, on I went to task number three, Ludo. Ludo is a dice rolling game in which you get 10 rolls and the higher the sum of your rolls, the better you do. The catch is your rolls only start to count after you roll your first six, unlocking, so to speak, your other rolls. For every six you roll, you get another roll, so if you roll sixes forever, you can keep on playing forever. The table I received uh, explored 20 games of Ludo, each consisting of 20 rolls, some of which would count, some of which wouldn't. 
My task was to provide the sum of all the rolls that counted and were within the 10 plus the number of sixes you rolled limit for each of the games. As was the case with the previous task, the results of the rolls were given in the form of cute little ASCII symbols. So naturally, the first thing I did was get rid of the cute ASCII symbols using search and replace. After I did that, I was stopped. Never before have I been so keenly aware of the fact that I was out of my element. I had no smart tricks up my sleeve. I was woefully underprepared, and that was the truth of it. But then I realized... Maybe I wasn't smart enough for this challenge. But there is an alternative to giving up when you can play smart. Play like an absolute dumbo. If I use conditional formatting to highlight every 6 in red, I will be able to see how many 6s are present in the first 10 rolls. Then it's just a matter of manually highlighting the number of cells that correspond to 10 plus the number of 6s present in that space. Then it's just a matter of looking at the selection autosum and manually inputting that as the answer for each row. But wait, should the first 6 count as part of the sum? No, it shouldn't, it was mentioned in the instructions somewhere, but it does count as one extra roll, so the minimum, provided I get at least one 6 in the first 10, should be 11. You're figuring it out. Challenge 4. Bingo. Each row of the table is one round of bingo, with 75 balls being selected. For the round to be considered complete, the pattern on screen must be completed. The answer that I needed to give was how many balls have to be selected before the sequence is complete for each of the games. So coming off the messy, messy solution of the last exercise, I felt somewhat reinforced in my intelligence by realizing that I will not be needing all the numbers on the bingo card, just the ones that constitute the pattern. I remembered that finding the last value on a list was something that I tried to figure out at work, unsuccessfully, so I got to googling. Uh, it wasn't much help, but I decided to try by checking if the number given in a particular cell appeared on the bingo board anywhere. And that proved to be more fruitful. Through some ungodly combination of uh, if and count if spawned by Satan himself, I was able to ascribe a value of 1 in the cell immediately above a cell that matched one of the numbers on the bingo card, and a zero if the number didn't match. That was something. Blissfully unaware of the fact that I had about 15 minutes to complete this exercise and start on the next one, I started googling counting unique values, distinct values, and all the other words that meant nothing to me at that moment. But then it struck me. Coming off the last exercise, I was filled with dump guy energy. Dump guy juice, if you will. This could be useful. Much like with the previous exercise, I could just use conditional formatting to my benefit, highlighting the important cells in red and seeing when the last one occurs. With absolutely zero further deliberation, I decided that it was a sound strategy and decided to go with it. I would then manually pick out the ball number for each row based on the last cell highlighted in red and manually input that into the answer box. As time-consuming as it was, it saved me more time than any further googling would. The good news was I only had one more task left. The bad news? I only had 10 minutes to complete it. So with less than 10 minutes on the clock, I started on task 5, the word search. I was presented with a truly, outrageously large word search where each cell of the table was one letter. I was then tasked with finding the row number of the first letter of each of the words I had to search for. Coming off the last two exercises, I immediately went for conditional formatting, but it wouldn't be so easy. As each of the cells only contained a single letter, I would have to use conditional formatting for each of them. I decided to fly by the seat of my pants and divide each of the words I was searching for into single letters using left and right formulas, and hoping that I would figure out something as I went. 
But the sad truth was, I didn't. I tried to conditionally format for the letters that constituted the first word, and there were just too many. I couldn't see a pattern in the humongous word search anywhere. I had about four minutes left, and no other ideas. I was pulling a complete blank. So I decided that after a bit more struggling with conditional formatting, it would be a good time to just send the file without completing the last task. Only after standing up did I realize that the first three questions were multiple choice and I could have just checked which answer was most appropriate. Hey guys, editing Simon here. The results just came in and I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is that only the top 128 players qualified for the next round and I was not within that group. But the good news is that I came in 151st out of about 550 competitors, which for a guy who mainly used conditional formatting in an Excel competition, that's not too bad, if I dare say so myself. Anyway, give me a shout if you want to battle on the battlefield of Microsoft Excel. I'm already thinking about applying next year. And hey, thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the next one.